Okay, so now we talked a little bit earlier about the processes um, in the deep water deposits at the bed scale. We then link that to FASHI's models of deep water fans and some of the controls we focused on grain size. We're now going to sort of reconsider deep water deposits in the context of sequence stratigraphic models. And I'm going to take you back to this slide, which um, which shows a, um, a 3D block diagram based on the classical sequence stratigraphic model. This top image for a shelf, a slope, and a basin floor fan. And this block diagram is showing deposition during fall in relative sea level. So that would be part of the falling stage systems tract that sometimes is called the early low stand systems tract. And the classical model predicts that it's those times falling sea level um, when we have a cutting of canyons or at least the bypass of sediment through canyons and we accumulate large volumes of sand on the basin floor. So the sequence stratigraphic models are pretty explicit. Deep water submarine fans, deep water reservoirs only occur during periods of falling and low relative sea level. And that, uh, that is quite a simplistic approach and we can think a bit more fully about various controls. So this slide here shows, um, shows some of those controls. So here we've got our, our shelf, our slope, our base and floor. In this, this cartoon here we have our basin floor submarine fan, deep water fan. That's fed through a, through a, a channel which is um, occupying a canyon system. The control I've just talked about, relative sea level, that's shown here with this blue arrow and of course relative sea level has its own uh, controls acting on it as well. Um, what are the other things here? So, so one thing would be um, sediment supply. So how much sediment are we feeding onto the shelf? Relative sea level controls accommodation, but in any sequence stratigraphic model, we also need to think about sediment supply. Uh, and that will determine how rapidly we're able to feed shorelines, including deltas, out to the shelf edge. We also need to think about the location of canyon systems. If canyons are part of this mechanism we need to infer to get submarine fans on the seabed, canyons don't occur everywhere. They occur in specific locations. Um, and those canyons extend some way back on the shelf. So actually, if we have a, a shoreline on the shelf that connects up to the head of that canyon, that means we can start bypassing sediment to the basin floor. We don't have to have that shoreline reaching to the shelf edge. Other things that are important, well, not just the sediment supply, but also the grain size of that sediment. Is it predominantly sandy? Is it predominantly muddy? That will determine the, 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 um, the character of that deep water fan system. We can also think about the triggers for um, for gravity flows at the shelf edge. That could be earthquakes, um, but it doesn't have to be. That can also be a function of how rapidly we are depositing sediments at the shelf edge and instability associated with that, maybe with growth faults. The slope it doesn't have to be a nice, smooth, continuous surface. It can be irregular, maybe reflecting salt tectonics or, or shale tectonics. Um, so, you know, the complexity of um, the way we root sediment, we transfer sediment from the shelf edge to the basin floor is also important. And of course, the basin floor itself doesn't have to be flat and, and featureless. That could also have some topography on it, and that will act to steer uh, gravity flows and deep marine fans into specific locations. As the name suggests, gravity flows, they follow gravity, they follow the lowest point in the topography. So even subtle topography has a, has a big impact on potential reservoir distribution and character.
Okay, so this text here, I think, I, is just a list of the features I've just talked about on that last slide. We need to think about the shelf. That's sometimes referred to as the staging area because that's where we store up the sediment that we, uh, at some later point, we'll release into deep water. What's the grain size? The frequency of magnitude of flow events. We can relate that to the triggers that cause those gravity flows. Sediment supply, um, and also processes at the outer shelf and the shelf edge. Are, are waves or tides important on, on the shelf and the shelf edge? That can also affect um, delivery of sediment to the basin floor. Okay, sea level change is important. That obviously falling sea level will tend to force um, shorelines to the shelf edge and there they can start bypassing sediment to the basin floor. But also the locations of major rivers because the rivers and the deltas they feed, they're the primary um, location of sediment at the shelf edge which then becomes transferred onto the basin floor. Talked about the slope, whether that's a simple slope with a simple gradient on it, whether it's more complex because of typically of structural tectonic uh, complications. Those, those structural features can be linked to the presence of mobile substrates. So in the subsurface, whether we have salt or, or mud diapirs, for example. The stability of the slope, is it, is it stable? Is it unstable? Uh, unstable slopes would be associated with growth faults uh, and tow thrusts, for example. Um, and then the locations of canyons uh, and the size of canyons, because that will control locally where we supply sediment to the basin floor. The basin floor itself, you know, what's its shape, what's its geometry, and it, does, is there a structural control on that shape or geometry of the base of the basin floor? That will determine the degree to which a deep water fan is confined by existing topography and the extent to which it, the basin floor um, does not confine the fan. So let me show you an example here from a, a basin in the Cretaceous uh, of the onshore US. These are a series of very closely spaced well logs over a distance of about 100 kilometers. The vertical scale here is a little bit over one kilometer. So shelf and predominantly sandy shelf deposits, shallow marine deposits are shown in yellow. Slope, predominantly muddy slope and basin floor deposits in blue and then coastal plain in green. And if we look at, you know, the the transition from the shelf to the slope. So this is our shelf edge. You can see that it's basically it's it's climbing upwards more or less continuously. There's a little bit of back and forth, but overall this is building up continuously. So it's an degrading and prograding shelf edge. If we look though on the, the lower part of the slope and the basin floor, you can see there are some some intervals where we have uh, sand, so here indicated by yellow in the um, the gamma ray logs which lie sort of in the background and there are some intervals where we just have um, mud and silt. Again sandy, 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 including some really quite substantial thicknesses up to a couple of hundred meters of, of sandy basin floor fans. So in this case, this example here, um, those basin floor fans are accumulating while we still have aggradation on the shelf. So these basin floor fans, they're not being forced by a fall in sea level. These reflect high sediment supply. And we can think about this as, as for a bit of a thought experiment. So I'm going to really focus on this, this graph on the, the top left in here. And this, this plots some data where we, we're, we're carrying out a thought experiment. We're making some assumptions and seeing what the effects of those assumptions will be. So what, what each of these data points here represents a delta, um, which is building out across the shelf. So these are all different modern deltas. We're going to assume here that, um, that sea level is rising 
basically two meters per thousand years. That's the average, global average over the last 10,000 years. And the sediment supply for those deltas is different depending on the drainage basins and the rivers which are supplying those deltas. Now deltas with the black dots, those deltas have a high sediment supply and sufficiently high that they, they will reach the shelf edge um, within a few tens of thousands of years. So you'll see there's a cluster of these deltas here that reach the shelf edge between zero and 20,000 years of this steady sea level rise. A few that take a few, you know, 30, 40,000 years. The white squares in here, these are rivers that will never reach the shelf edge. The sediment supply is not high enough to overcome this two meter per thousand year rise in sea level. So these deltas here, they need to have a fall in sea level if they're going to supply sediment to the shelf edge. So I think the, the key thing here is that basically there's a large number of modern deltas that will reach the shelf edge without a fall in sea level. And again, that's in contrast to the sequence stratigraphic models we talked about earlier. And it emphasizes maybe the importance of thinking not just of sea, of sea level accommodation, but also of sediment supply and other controls. I also mentioned the slope. This is something that the, the, the shape of the slope and the degree to which it's, uh, it's a smooth surface or it has some irregularities in it. This is something that Mike Mayo will develop further with you later, this, later today. Um, but if we're looking really at this at two, two cross sections here going from base, sorry, landward on the left to basinwood on the right, uh, the top image shows a shelf, a smooth slope, and a basin floor, a uh, smooth basin floor. So this is more, more or less corresponds, this sort of geometry and the configuration more or less corresponds to the situation which is envisaged in the, the, uh, the basic sequence stratigraphic model. The bottom image here shows a tectonically active shelf edge, um, slope, and basin floor. So here's the shelf, here's the slope, here's the basin floor. The shelf edge characterized by growth faults and basically gravity tectonics. Those growth faults basically um, will act to, to push the overall succession down towards the basin floor. As we do that, at the base of the slope, we have thrust systems, toe thrusts. If the top of the slope is moving downwards, that's that's extending we have to have compression at the base of the slope so these toe thrusts are the expression of that and we might also have irregularities in the slope itself so what are labeled on here as mini basins those could be occurring in between salt diapirs or shale diapirs for example the other thing which isn't shown on this diagram is if you have extension here compression here we have to have some sort of detachment surface, a weak layer for those, for those two sets of faults to sole out on. Um, those, those, those toe thrusts have to end against a weak layer, the growth faults, those have to terminate against a weak layer and that often that salt or um, overpressured shale. Um, and an irregular slope with mini basins or these little small basins, just um, piggyback basins really but associated with toe thrusts. Those are places that we can accumulate deep water sands. Uh, and tracing those out can be very important. Okay, let's go back now to, uh, to our, our basic sequence stratigraphic model. Um, and Actually, not just the model, but also some common observations that we see in many deep water fan systems that tell us something about how those fans evolved. So we tend to see basically three stages in the growth of a, of a deep water fan. And the slides I'll show you will link those to changes in sea level. Uh, other controls can also occur, obviously. Um, but the observations we see these three stages of fan development. So the three images on the left are maps. So looking down on map view of the system, 
the three images on the right are cross sections and each cross section corresponds to a map. So we're going to start at the bottom uh, image here. So here we basically have the initiation of a deep water fan. In this case, that's the control which is shown is, is a fall in relative sea level. So this will be the falling stage systems tract. Uh, sea level basically at the shelf edge. The shelf edge being unstable and generating uh, slumps, and slides or mass transport complexes. And they're the first deposits we see on the basin floor. If we look at that in map view, we can see these slope failure scars so, or slump scars. Bypass of that material that's taken from the shelf edge and is then deposited on, on the basin floor as, as mass transport complexes. So slope failure, that's, that's the first element in here. Okay, we then have the development this in the second stage. Again, in this, this, this cross section here is showing sea level still at the shelf edge. So effectively valleys and canyons bypassing sediment onto the basin floor. And there we see, you know, sandy channels on the slope and the accumulation of thick um, sandstone rich deep water fan deposits on the basin floor. So this is still part of the, the falling stage systems tract through into the, the low stand systems tract. And really what we're seeing here is bypass of sediment um, across the shelf, across the slope and onto the basin floor. And then the third stage is really, if you like, is sort of the abandonment of this system. So here, if we think about sea level, this is when sea level is rising. Um, this, would re this would be the later part of the, um, the low stand systems tract through to the transgressive systems tract. Uh, we have deposition on the slope. So essentially these will be slope fans. We're not really getting much sediment reaching the basin floor. Uh, so here again in map view, you know, fan systems with a smaller area confined to the slope uh, and often rather sand poor, often quite muddy. If we think about taking a cross section through a canyon, often again a recurring pattern that we see follows those three different stages of the fan evolution. We see the same thing in the fill of canyons. So here is a cross section through a canyon. Here's a vertical log through the middle of the canyon. And here are some sketch maps showing, you know, the, the, um, the geography of, 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 of channel systems infilling the canyon in different parts of the canyon fill. So the lower part of the canyon fill, this green color, is associated with slumps and debris flows. So mass transport deposits. So this is that early stage of, of failure um, of the shelf edge. Then above that, we have stacked sandy channel fills. So high nets of growth stacked channel fills. If you look at those channels in map view, we see those, those are, um, have fairly low sinuosities. And these really would be you know, the equivalent to the, the sandy um, basin floor fans on the basin floor. So really the early part of the low stand systems tract or the, or the later part of the falling stage systems tract in the conventional model. And then the top part of the canyon fill is characterized by muddy um, channelized systems. If we look at those systems in, in plan view, they are very sinuous and in logs that that corresponds to a low net to gross interval of the um, of the canyon fill. So again, this will be the later part of the low stand systems tract. Let me show you some, some real data to illustrate those cartoons. So this, this top image is the one to focus on here. The bottom image is a sort of a line drawing cartoonified version of this, this, this the real data here. Here's the um, the fan system, the base is around in here and we see these rather chaotic seismic fasces. Those are our debris flow or, or mass transport complexes. Above that, we have more organized deposits with, with higher amplitudes. You can trace that out to, to define a, a, a clear sort of mounded geometry, but at, at a big scale. This would be our sandy basin floor fan deposits. 
and then above that we have this um, these more localized and lower amplitude um, seismic fasces associated with uh, with channels and, and, and levees and this would correspond to the this slope channel system um, and you know that that's that's the seismic the typical sort of seismic expression of these three different stages in, in fan development some more nice nice uh, seismic data these are from from shallow so geologically recent and shallowly buried deep water systems so they're very well imaged in in high resolution seismic data this case we're looking at uh, mass transport complexes so slumps and slides here we've got a map view and here is the uh, expression of one of those uh, mass transport complexes you'll see that the seismic character is really is kind of rather opaque and rather looks rather uniform um, at the very front of this we can see these sort of fingers protruding out so again this is typical of, of these mass transport complexes that this indicates a sort of the, the flow uh, direction and complexity at the front of the flow. If we take a cross section in the flow direction, that's what this this line D at the bottom is showing. You can see internally the mass transport complex again. It has this rather sort of structureless and low amplitude internal character, but you can see it's got you know it, it cuts down deeply, and then at the front of that mass transport complex, that's really where it stops moving. You can see this abrupt kind of upward step in the uh, in the position of that mass transport complex and then it, it finally terminates somewhere around in here the level we were looking at in that that time slice in map view is 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 indicated by the yellow arrow we take a cross section at 90 degrees to that we see a similar kind of thing very deep erosion Effectively, that, that mass transport complex, it acts like a plow. It, it pushes the sediment out in front of it. Um, so, these, so these are, you know, very strongly erosive bases. Another example of a, a mass transport complex, uh, the outline in the map view shown by the yellow dotted line. And you can see these sort of curved linear features in the map. We look at a cross section through that then this is what we see. This is a mass transport complex and in this case we can see there's a series of what seem to be steeply inclined surfaces in here and if we really zoom into those these are basically thrust faults uh, shown in the data and then the interpreted version in here. We imagine this mass of sediment moving down a slope and then it, it stops against the sea, uh, uh, positive relief on the sea floor the have, we have to have compression accommodating that, that slowing down and stopping of the, the, the mass transport complex. Um, so in this case it's nice because we can image these, these thrust faults often particularly in more deeply buried systems that we would not see these quite so clearly in, this, in the data. Okay let's think about now the um, the basin floor fan itself so again the the lower part of that tends to have high amplitudes be sand rich and see sort of frontal splay geometry so channels that branch down dip and they they pass into kind of broad uh, extensive lobes here's a, a a map view looking straight down here's a somewhat oblique view of a different example here's the channel single channel here then it splits into smaller and smaller channels feeding this sort of leaf shaped um, fan fan lobe on the basin floor above that we have this lower amplitude section more localized channels including with levees and those channels stacking up vertically offset a little bit but you know really clear nice nice clear channel geometries okay let's stop there and we'll we'll meet up live and, and I'll introduce an exercise. <laughs>